हाँ जी अब देखें इन शह आ जाओ आ गया ना गुड सलामकुम मिया साहब वेलकम भाई आवाज आ रही है साथिया test 1 2 three. thank you ji jo log aa gaye hain inko khush aamdeed aur main zara intezar kar raha hu speaker sahab abhi thodi der pehle aa gaye the aur meri unse baat bhi hui hai to fir humne faisla kiya tha ki aa gaye hain khalifa sahab aa gaye hain that's nice hi assalam alaikum जमीर मुझे दो तीन मिनट और चाहिए होंगे आई एम जस्ट वेटिंग फॉर फ्यू मोर पीपल टू कम आज ट्वेंटी की रजिस्ट्रेशन थी अभी तक बारह आए हैं बस पंद्रह हो जाए तो हम शुरू करते हैं जी फिर बार बार अनाउंसमेंट बार बार करनी पड़ती है उससे बचने के लिए मैं जरा आई विल स्टार्ट इट अपने प्रोफेसर जयाउद्दीन साहब भी हैं लाइन पे जी जी मैंने उनको वेलकम किया है एक्चुअली अगर थोड़ा सा कैमरा नीचे कर दे ना वो अपना तो फिर उनकी पूरा फेस नजर आएगा अभी उनका जरा फेस पूरा नजर नहीं आ रहा है ये अब ठीक है मियाँ साहब सर बहुत शुक्रिया आप तशरीफ लाए आज देखें जमील आया हुआ है इन शह अल्लाह का इसका लेक्चर बड़ा अच्छा होता है सेकेंड टाइम आया ये आप म्यूटेड है मियाँ साहब बहुत खुशी हुई आपको देख के बहुत अरसे के बाद आपके लेक्चर हमें अभी भी मुझे याद हैं और बड़ा मजा आता था मिया साहब आपका माइक म्यूट है अभी प्राइवेट बहुत हो रही है वी हैव अनदर टू थ्री मिनट्स अब तो अनम्यूट कर दिया मैंने हाँ जी आ रही है अब आपकी आवाज आ रही है आप लोगों से सीख के हम लोग सब यहाँ तक पहुंचे हैं मियाँ साहब जी क्या पूछा मैंने कहा आपसे ही सीख के हम यहाँ तक पहुंचे हैं शुक्रिया बहुत बहुत आप खुद बहुत काबुल थे आप अपनी काबिलियत के पर आप आपका तो फैमिली इन ग्रैंड क्वालिटीज है सारी ये अलहमदुल्ला देखे ना चारों में से कोई किसी से कम नहीं रहा अल्लाह की रहमत है जी एल एन जी टैंक्स पर आपने कोई खास काम किया हुआ है जी मैं वो सोच रहा था इंट्रोड्यूस करूंगा मैंने मैं चार मुख्तलिफ प्रोजेक्ट्स हैं जिनमें एल एन जी स्टोरेज टैंक्स थे तो मैंने पंद्रह बीस टैंक बनवाए हैं फिर वो हमने कोई कोड भी लिखा है नया इसका एस सी कोड फिर जो हमारी एक्सम नोबल ग्लोबल प्रैक्टिस वो मैंने लिखी है एल एन जी टैंक डिज़ाइन पे तो काफ़ी काम किया इसमें जी फिर तो आपका एक्सपीरियंस जो आप बताएंगे बहुत फायदा होगा बहुत गेन करेंगे नहीं कुछ तो होपफुली इंफॉर्मेटिव होगा जी इंशाल्लाह शाह मेरे पास 15 पार्टिसिपेंट्स हैं ये मुझे बताएं 15 में से ये सारे रजिस्टर्ड हैं कि दूसरे भी आए हुए हैं तो फिर तो शुरू कर सकते हैं अगर पंद्रह के पंद्रह आए हैं फेसबुक ठीक है या राइट इट इज 6 मिनट्स पास्ट 
2 p.m. As it's a norm for us to start a bit late, as people start, I think, coming on on Zoom at about two, and it it takes them about five to six minutes that we get the full quorum. Still, it is 15, five are still awaited. Anyhow, they will join us late. Uh, today, as you know, it's our 33rd lecture uh, from Pakistan uh, Society of Civil Engineering. And I, uh, sorry, I should have said it earlier. I welcome on behalf of Pakistan Society of Civil Engineers, Dr. Jabir Abdin Khalifa, uh, Mia Ziaudi, and all other participants. Uh, uh, to this uh, uh, forum where we are going to present you with, a, with our technical lecture number 33. And today's topic is LNG storage tanks, overview and some design aspects. Uh, the speaker, as I have already said, is Dr. Jamil Udin Khalifa, a very uh, experienced engineer. He, his experience is uh, reckoned with internationally, Alhamdulillah, Pakistani, and uh, most probably he settled in, I think, in uh, Canada at the moment, but he's very much by soul a Pakistani and we are proud of him. So before I start with his uh, introduction, uh, I will have, it's my duty and responsibility to tell you the rules of this uh, <clears throat> uh, technical lecture. All the participants who are registered uh, for the lecture have to appear live on web uh, on webcam all the time during the lecture. As I have said uh, many times that it is a rule prescribed by Pakistan Engineering Council and it has to be followed strictly. Only there is a concession given to the ladies. They have to appear live, but if they want, they can cover their face. No issues there. During the lecture, the microphones of all the participants shall remain in mute position so that no background sound disturbs the speaker. And uh, the third is the question answer session. As you know, we have at the end uh, 20 minutes question answer session that will take place, but a uh, speaker has uh, allowed that uh, you can ask the questions during the lecture as he is delivering and uh, I would uh, prefer that uh, if you have to ask the question during the lecture, then please type it in the text box. I will read the questions that will keep the flow smooth of the speaker. Otherwise, it would be difficult to control here on Zoom. During the question answer session, uh, 20 minute question answer session, at that time, if anybody likes, he can ask questions through the microphone in his voice. No issues there. So this is uh, this was the rules, and now I will introduce Dr. Jamiluddin Khalifa to you. Khalifa, a very difficult task to summarize your. You don't have to do much introduction, Dahir. It's okay. <laughs> I would feel guilty uh, if I don't introduce you in detail. So the people must know that a Pakistani, where he is placed, and what he is doing. So, G. Dr. Saab did his uh, BSc Civil Engineering uh, uh, from UET Lahore in 1980. Then he proceeded to Canada. He joined the University of Toronto. And there he did his first, he did his master's in 1982. And then he did his uh, uh, PhD, both master's and PhD in structural engineering from University of Toronto. And he completed his PhD in November 1986. Now, his, uh, <clears throat> currently he is posted in Kuala Lumpur, where he is now from where right now he is delivering the lecture from Kuala Lumpur. And uh, he is working there with Exxon Mobil. And he is posted in Kuala Lumpur since uh, 2019. And he's an engineering manager there on the project, uh, which is uh, NFPS compression project. It comprises eight offshore compression complexes. It has uh, a 280 kilometer offshore fuel gas network and onshore uh, and uh, onshore control room. And the cost of the project is $25 billion. 
the uh, Pakistanis in charge of this project, mashallah. <coughs> then uh, we have the, then prior to this assignment, uh, Khalifa Saab was uh, engineering manager in Melbourne, provide, uh, probably with the same company. And that project also comprises, was a, uh, he was in Melbourne, listed in Melbourne, and that project comprises well pads, gathering lines, ga gas conditioning plant, 250 kilometers of pipelines, and uh, the project cost about $7 billion. And earlier today, he has worked everywhere uh, in the, uh, I think, uh, on uh, offshore projects, comprising offshore projects, onshore projects, basically in the, uh, I think, in the oil oil sector and uh, he was in Houston from uh, in 2018 as an upstream civil advisor. Then he worked in, uh, I think in Kazakhstan on another project, 10 days future growth project. And uh, that was again, it comprised dredging of 70 kilometer channel in Caspian Sea and construction of 40 kilometer long heavy haul road. Uh, you see the, I mean, complexity of the project he has been handling. Then he was also from 2008 to 2016, he was a, a engineering manager with Hebron GBS, where he uh, where he was, uh, he did the detailed engineering and field engineering of Hebron offshore gravity-based structure uh, uh, to support about 65,000 ton top sites. Again, a project of $14 billion. He has served in uh, Abu Dhabi as a site manager on similar projects. He has served uh, in Canada, in USA, and uh, Dr. Sahib, I'm just uh, telling them, uh, uh, I mean, how much exposure you have worldwide. So, and ba basically, you know, he has, uh, on his CV, he has written 35 years, maybe he has forgotten that he has no experience of 40 plus years, 42 years. I know because he was my class fellow also. So my experience is uh, uh, more than 40 years. So it is the same for him also. And uh, as I I'm said- I'm trying to pretend I'm still young, Zahir Sahib. I'm trying to pretend I'm still young. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> and so basically- You're right. <laughs> You're right. We have the same experience, yes. Thank you. Basically, he is an expert of project management, construction management, and engineering management. And apart from these skills, he has ability to design experience and ability to design onshore plants, LNG tanks, offshore structures, and port facilities. Mashallah. Now, straight away, I will. Uh, now you have the idea what the man uh, uh, is and how and why he is a. I call him that. We are proud of him. Now his, he has uh, some technical uh, uh, publications also where, uh, that I will tell you now. Its first one is Design and Construction of Hebron GBS. Uh, I think this uh, was published in Concrete International July 2016. Then uh, there are some papers which have been published or he has read it in the conferences, Crack with Calculation. According to NSP 473, it was an ACI convention in the October 2015. Then seismic design of Hebron platform, OMAE conference in St. John's to, uh, in June 2015. Then determination of wave impact loads on Hebron GBS, OMAE conference in San Francisco in June 2014. And uh, then it is design of Hebron gravity-based structure for iceberg uh, impact. It is ISOP conference, uh, Anchorage, June 2013. And the last one is limit analysis and design of reinforced concrete shell elements. That was his PhD thesis. Now he's a member of two technical committees. Of one is member A ACI committee number 376. This is concrete structures for uh, refrigerated uh, liquefied gas containment developed code for concrete LNG tanks. And the second one is member, he's the ISO committee member of SC7WG4. So this is what uh, I really try. My colleague was just uh, signaling me that you are taking more time for the introduction. So doctor, I'll just stop here. And this was a very brief introduction of Doxa. So 
the floor is yours please continue all right thank you sir sir for a very gracious introduction and thank you for inviting me to uh, present uh, something on lng tanks today i'm going to share my screen hopefully you can see it shortly are you able to see my screen so I, i'm assuming you can see my screen yes i i guess i can't hear you guys up you're muted now we have see we can see the screen but all the icons of your desktop the present yeah now it's okay please i will fix hopefully now it should be good yeah yeah it's okay now please go ahead <clears throat> all right so uh, i was i will share with you today a uh, little bit about lng storage tanks and my apologies the earlier title of the topic was to talk about the tangis project where we built a port but unfortunately i was not able to get permission from some of our um, owner um, oil companies uh, especially the one out of russia and kazakhstan so we had to make a late change but hopefully this will be somewhat informative for the, for the participants as well so uh, just to give you some background with vis-a-vis uh, -vis the lng tanks uh, i have worked on four lng storage tank projects uh, for qatar gas for ras gas for southok which is in wales uk and golden pass which is in uh, texas in usa uh, these were going on uh, about 10 15 years ago and there were multiple storage tanks for each of these projects so in it well, furthermore i also developed the uh, global practice which is really a specification for lng tanks for design and construction for exxon mobil and i'm a subject matter expert for the company and then i think as tahir mentioned that i am on aci 376 committee i'm a voting member and about 10 years ago we uh, actually wrote a new code for lng tanks because aci code did not have a uh, you know you are probably familiar with aci 318 which is the code for structural concrete design and there is another one aci 350 which is for water retaining structures but there wasn't a code that would handle these uh, re refrigerated liquefied gases so we wrote that code it was published a few years ago and right now i'm working on we are working on uh, a, a new uh, addition a new revision on that particular uh, code so with that background uh, let me move forward why can't i move forward okay so normally in our oil and gas industry we start every meeting with a safety moment and i thought i will uh, do the same today i will talk a little bit and normally you know our industry uh, there is we are working with hydrocarbons so you have to be very careful and there's a lot of safety procedures in place so why do we start with the safety moments in meetings just to remind ourselves to be safe and not just at work but also at home so i thought i'll share this uh, recent one that came out of our, our company uh, about food safety so i won't read everything on this page but some key items are that you know always buy good quality fruits and vegetables from reputable sources because we really are what we eat you know if you're buying tinned or packaged stuff avoid dented or damaged damaged packing and then always check expiry dates because sometimes you buy these uh, packaged products and they are already past their expiry date secondly keep uh, raw meat poultry and seafood separate and from each other and also make sure that these meats are properly cooked um it's pretty hot right now in in lahore or pakistan so any cooked item should not be left outside at room temperature for more than 2 hours or less than an hour if the temperature is above 32 degrees and never refreeze any thawed item whether it is meat or vegetables or pastry or fish because not only does it lose its value in terms of um, its energy or uh, or or uh, uh, calories but it can also you can also introduce germs in it and finally hygiene is important always wash your hands before preparing food after handling food and clean surfaces that you have been preparing food on or eating so that this way we can keep everything clean and antiseptic so that was just a short safety moment 
and we will get now into the topic itself. So what is LNG? I, I think you've heard a lot in the news lately in Pakistan, but you know, we have bought some more LNG at the highest rates possible and we won't get into the politics of that, but LNG is really liquefied natural gas. You know what we call sui gas in Pakistan? It is if you cool this to minus 168 degrees C, it turns into a colorless liquid. It is primarily methane, which is CH4. It has a specific gravity of less than 0.5. So it's half as heavy as water. And when you cool it and liquefy it, the volume is reduced by 600 times. So why is this important? Well, now it becomes economical to transport it by ships or tankers like we do oil. So you really don't need pipelines anymore. So for the longest while, this was called stranded gas because this gas was in areas where there were no pipelines close by. So you could not utilize the gas, but with this LNG and being able to transport it through ships it, economically, a lot of places in the world are now using LNG. Uh, and it is also cleaner burning and better for the environment than coal or oil. So the market for LNG has really mushroomed in the last decade. Um, China is buying a lot of it. They're trying to get rid of their coal and all over the place in Pakistan, you know, we are short of gas. So gas is going down every year. And you know, there's been a lot of uh, stories over the last several years. In fact, we tried to build a terminal in Karachi as well, Port Qasim, but didn't, was not, did not come to fruition. So who are the biggest producers of LNG today? So Australia is number one. It produces 78 million metric tons a year. And Qatar is kind of right behind at 77 million metric tons. And they have a plan to increase this to 120 million tons by the end of the decade. They have two large projects that are currently ongoing to enable this, uh, this uh, increase. All right. So what are LNG storage tanks? Um, so LNG is produced in liquefaction plants that remove water, other liquids, H2S from raw gas, and progressively cool it until it liquefies. And this plant is called a train. So if you look at the picture on the right-hand side, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but you know, these are three different trains or three different uh, um, liquefaction plants. Raw gas comes in at one end and at the other end, it comes out as a liquid, very cold, and then it is transported uh, uh, to wherever it's needed. So traditionally these were located onshore, but recently there are also floating facilities have been built, which are called so-called FLNG, so that eliminates the need for offshore real estate. So if you look at the picture or the cartoon right at the bottom of the, of the slide, you will see on the extreme left, a offshore platform, most of this gas source is, uh, is offshore. So their wells are drilled and then gas is extracted and it is pumped onshore. Onshore then you will have a liquefaction plant. And once it's, you know, again, the one liquefaction plant will be the picture I've shown you on the top right. After it is liquefied, then you, what is circled in this orange circle is an LNG storage tank. So it is stored there until a tanker comes by and then you fill the tanker with the, with the coal gas and the tanker will then uh, transport it to another similar uh, jetty where it is received. And then it is stored again and it is offloaded into a tank. And then a lot of this LNG is used around the world for producing electricity. Uh, in Pakistan, um, you know, we have two um, uh, um, terminals currently in Port Qasim. Uh, there we use it mostly for uh, domestic use. We don't, and then some of it is used for power as well. So these tanks are, are insulated tanks and LNG is stored in a liquid state at cryogenic temperatures. And these are, as I said, typically located near production facilities or at receiving terminals. So Port Qasim in Karachi, I said, has two terminals, but we, since there is no real estate there, so those are floating storage and regasification units. So I don't know if any of you have gone to Port Qasim to see these, uh, but it is really like a ship that is anchored next to the jetty and another ship will come or a tanker will come with the LNG 
It is offloaded into that storage, floating storage facility, and then regasified and pumped directly into pipelines. So I've been there at least once, and we did some uh, navigation studies. We were trying to build another terminal, a private terminal. Uh, we were very close to getting an agreement with the government, but then the elections occurred and the government changes, all the minister changed, and that, unfortunately, we could not uh, move forward with that. Okay, so there are several types of storage tanks. And uh, there are some uh, sketches on the right-hand side. And I'm going to start with the bottom, uh, which is titled single containment. So a single containment storage tank, the, there is an inner container which stores the liquid nitrogen and is liquid tight. And there is an outer container which basically contains the vapor that comes out of this gas. Because you know this gas is cold, but it is always evaporating because the ambient outside is, is warm. Even though the tank is insulated, you do have some vaporization. So you need a tank to contain the, the vapor. And then there is also a dike provided on the outside, which was there that in case the inner tank leaks for some reason in, in an accidental condition, then the, li the liquid LNG is contained. Uh, the one, again, if you move over to the uh, bottom right corner, the next type of tank is called a double containment tank. So the, the inner tank is liquid tight and it is also vapor tight. And then there is a secondary tank outside it, you know, this, you see this concrete tank, which is a liquid tight container, but not vapor tight. So in case there is a leak from the inner tank, you really don't release it into the environment, but an out outer tank will retain that. And then you have what is called a full containment tank. And we will talk today, our, my talk today will primarily relate to full containment tanks. So the full containment tank is shown on top, on the right hand side. And there is a liquid tight primary container shown in red, which contains the LNG. And then this is also, uh, and then this is enclosed by a secondary tank, which is liquid tight and vapor tight. So in case the inner tank leaks the, and the LNG leaks out into the annular space between the two tanks, the outer tank will retain the liquid and the vapor. Now, lately there's been another type of tank used called a membrane tank. And a membrane tank is really, the product is retained by a liquid tight and vapor tight membrane that is uh, structurally supported by the outer tanks. And I will show you a couple of sketches of these in the following slides. So these days, single containment tanks are generally not used because they have higher risk of loss of containment. So what are some typical features of these tanks? Uh, these are usually large capacity because if you make it small, then it is not economical. So between 100 to 200,000 cubic meters of stored LNG, typically 70 to 100 meter in diameter, 30 to 45 meters tall. The inner tank is a steel tank, usually made from 9% nickel steel plates. So why 9% nickel? Because with the, when you add 9% nickel to the steel alloy, it becomes, it remains ductile at minus 167 degrees C. Normal carbons, carbon steel will become brittle and it will crack. So recently, uh, we've also recognized uh, tanks made with concrete for inner tank as well. And this has been recognized by the new ACI 376 LNG storage uh, code. There have been some that have been built in the past, but uh, only small ones, but now there is an actual code which allows you to design these uh, in concrete as well. The outer tank is typically constructed with pre-stressed concrete that is lined with a carbon steel plate on the inside, which will provide the vapor tightness and also liquid tightness if the inner tank fails. So I've shown at the bottom on the right-hand side, a uh, cross-section of what the tank looks like. There's a base slab out of concrete and then there's a wall. And then on the top, if you look at the extreme bottom right, uh, the wall extends all the way up to the top. And then there's a concrete roof. Uh, these are pre-stressed. So 
uh, you know, you have both vertical and horizontal pre-stressing, as well as this ring, this pre-stressing in this ring being to, uh, to, to restrain the dome. And why do we need pre-stressing? Because in case the inner tank leaks, then the cold LNG uh, sits against concrete. And the only way to make it crack free is to add pre-stressing. And we'll talk a little bit more about it in the, in the uh, forthcoming slides. So we said this is minus 168 degrees C. Of course, if you leave it out in the environment, it'll just evaporate and become gas again. So we typically use perlite for insulation. And in the annular space between the two tanks, it's about a meter to two meters, that is filled with perlite and that provides insulation. So it will it means it maintains the temperature uh, and, and reduces the uh, vaporization. These tanks are typically founded on bedrock or on piles because we want to limit settlements, particularly differential movement, because you know the inner tank is steel tank, so you don't want it to have differential differential settlement, which will cause it to buckle. And um, most of these tanks have been designed to either the uh, Euronorm BS14620 or the newly developed, well, I guess I'm calling it newly, but it's been five years now, the ACI 3764. These uh, kind of cartoons give you some examples of the some other types of tanks. So the one on the extreme left, let's start with that. That's a full containment tank with an inner tank made out of concrete. Uh, this tank is uh, sometimes will have reinforcement that is made out of 9% nickel as well uh, to keep it uh, from cracking. Uh, and, so, and then the outer tank is just concrete. Now, why do we think of use going to concrete tanks? Well, uh, there was been a lot of these tanks were being built uh, in the last decade, uh, mid, mid 2000s. 9% nickel became very, uh, was a very long lead item. There were not enough uh, mills which could produce enough plate in time. So it would take a long time to procure. You also needed specialized welders to weld it, specialized equipment, because this welding has to be very carefully done with no, uh, no, um, for, uh, no, no, no kind of, um, what do you call it, Just cracks in it. And Concrete can be produced as a low tech material. It can be produced in almost any country in the world. And so we were able to reduce the cost and also reduce the schedule by about three months, which was critical because usually these tanks take about three years to design and build. Now, if you move over to the right-hand side, this is a membrane type tank. So this is very similar to the one that I showed you on the previous uh, page or the one on the left with the inner concrete tank, except that the, uh, if you take a, this, if you look at this red box here, so this is basically uh, showing you the example of how the membrane is placed. So this is uh, the, the base slab here, and then you have solid block insulation, and then this plywood on top, and then this is a membrane on, placed on top of that. So this membrane really, if you look at it, is thin uh, plates which are uh, crimped together to provide liquid tightness, and vapor tightness. And the same thing occurs on the walls as well. Just assume it's rotated and it's against the wall. Uh, so the, the, this thin membrane, of course, cannot provide any structural retention of the hydrostatic pressures. But because it is placed right against the wall or the slab, then the outer wall then provides the structural strength. So then again, the picture in the middle at the bottom uh, shows you the same that I talked about uh, just a minute ago that this membrane here is supported on the wall through this uh, insulation, whereas the traditional full containment tank is a self-standing uh, steel tank, uh, which is a structural tank uh, on the inside. I can stop here for a second if there are any questions or if you want me to continue. I think you may have some questions there, uh, Thayer Sab, if you want me to address those or no, uh, we don't have any questions yet, but you continue. And whenever a question is asked, I, I'll interrupt you conveniently. OK, very good. So what are typical design loads for such tanks? We actually consider two loading conditions, the normal, so-called normal loading conditions and the emergency loading conditions. So normal loading conditions, most of our people on this call 
or on this uh, uh, lecture are, are familiar with. You know, you design for construction loads, any maintenance loads, testing phase. You know, and I talk about a hydro test. These tanks are hydro tested. And then the outer tank is also pneumatically tested because we wanted to maintain the vapor. Then this is the operating phase in which you are loading LNG into the tank, re removing LNG from the tank. And then we also design it for a seismic load uh, in case it is in a seismic zone. So these are the normal conditions that most of you are familiar with. But for these LNG tanks, we have some special conditions that I want to mention to you. So one is so-called safe shutdown earthquake. So the normal operating or the operating basis earthquake would be, let's say a 500 year return earthquake or a 300 period return period earthquake during which the tank is designed to be functional and not have any damages to it. The safe shutdown earthquake could be like a 2,500 year return level earthquake. And the goal here is that if that kind of an earthquake occurs, we should be able to safely shut down the tank and de uh, decommission it in the sense that we don't want, under that condition, there could be localized damage, but there is, should be no uh, release of the product to the environment. And the tank may not necessarily be reusable after that, but we can shut it down, we can take the LNG out, and there is no release to the environment. So that's one that we check for an emergency condition. Then we also check for a condition where the inner tank has failed and now the LNG is, is leaked out and is being retained by the concrete tank. So some of you may have designed water retaining tanks. Okay, that's a challenge in itself. You want to make sure the crack widths are below a certain limit and there may be no thickness, no through thickness cracking. Now here we not only have a liquid in there, but it is at minus 168 degrees. So we want to test that condition. And this is one I will talk a little bit more about on the next slide. We also look at a certain earthquake along with that spill condition. Uh, we also check for fire outside the, 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 the LNG tank because these are close to liquefaction facilities. So you really need to make sure that the fire, it can handle the fire. Any impact loads, uh, you know, um, in the, in, when we were looking at these in the Middle East, there was concern about missile attacks. So we designed it for a, some sort of a missile impact, blast loads. And then also sometimes you could have a localized leak and you can get a cold spot on the wall. So we check for all these conditions. Now in this lecture today, I cannot go through all of these, but I will talk about how do we design for the LNG spill condition which I think might be something interesting and you may not have seen this before. So what are we trying to demonstrate in the spill condition? We want to demonstrate that in that condition, when the cold LNG is in contact with the concrete wall and has hydrostatic stress and, 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 has a, the, and the concrete is loaded due to hydrostatic stresses, there will be no leakage. But how do the codes guarantee that? By maintaining a bi-directional compression zone in the wall of 10% of the wall thickness or 75 millimeters and a minimum compressive stress of one MPA. Now, how do we do this? We do this using a non-linear finite element analysis. So this is a pretty complex analysis. And I'll walk you through a little bit on the sketches on the right-hand side. So it shows you an analysis that was done for a particular tank. So we will, we, so, so if you look at the, uh, let's, if you can see my curse cursor, the concrete is analyzed as different layers within the thickness. And then the rebar is analyzed, is, is modeled as a separate layer. Uh, similarly, if you look at the wall, you, 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 we, we model the uh, uh, pre-stressing tendons. We again put a lot more layers, 16 layers in the wall, and this will become important when I talk about uh, some of the further things on it, because we want to uh, demonstrate that some of these layers are indeed crack-free, right? Otherwise, if you have a through thickness crack, the LNG will leak. And similarly, the base slab is modeled in certain layers. So that's a, a complex finite element model. Now we want to use, we want to apply mechanical properties for each of these materials appropriate to the temperature that they, have, they are seeing. 
So at low temperatures, interestingly, concrete gets stronger, which is uh, maybe not uh, obvious. But at, a low, at these low temperatures, the concrete strength goes up. Steel, of course, becomes brittle. So no, it, it, just a minute. Yeah. I have to make one. I'm sorry, I have to make one announcement. Sure. But there are certain participants who have not switched on their webcam. Those who are the aspirants of CPD points, they have to keep their cam live so that I can see them. Please observe the rules and don't make the situation difficult for me. This is a PEC rule and I have to make sure that it is observed. Thank you very much. Please go ahead, doctor. Yeah, so if you look at this stress strain curve uh, in the middle of the slide on the right hand side, you know, at 20 degrees, your concrete strength may be 30 MPA or something, but at minus 170, it could be, you know, it shows it's 80 or so. So this comp compressive strength goes up. We also have to model the tensile stress strain curve for concrete, uh, for concrete. otherwise you cannot really do this analysis. So we, you can either use the CEB FIP tension softening model, which is kind of bilinear. So you go up to a certain point, it cracks, and then you degrade the, the, uh, the strength in a bilinear uh, fashion. There are different models, but these are some that we use in this particular analysis. And then we will check these, uh, the, the, the cracking and the uh, compression zone through this analysis. Now, the chart at the right at the bottom is quite interesting. So this shows you the development of temperature in the wall and at different times. So this dark blue line with the diamond is time zero. So time zero means when the LNG has just leaked and it comes in contact with the wall. So at time zero, the wall is at, let's say 30 degrees Celsius, which is the ambient temperature, uh, whatever is in the environment outside. And then at two minutes, that's the pink line, you see that the wall is starting to cool. You know? So the first kind of, uh, I think the, 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 at maybe a couple of inches now has started to cool down and, and it's uh, slowly starting to cool. Then at one hour, it's this kind of bluish green line. It, the, the, the cold is progressing through the wall. And then at seven days, you have a steady state condition. So you start off at minus 180 on the inside and it goes out to you know about a zero degree on the outside. So these you have to do these analysis for all these transient and the final state conditions to be able to demonstrate that we can maintain that concrete uncracked thickness uh, throughout the uh, cooling of the wall. So this is just a result from an analysis of, of such a finite element analysis. So we are looking at the wall. And this is a vertical section through the wall. And the first chart, the chart in the middle, is for circumferential stress. So the black line represents the minimum three inches of, of thickness that you need to maintain in compression. And these other various colors are at different time steps of what is the actual compression zone. And you will see that you know uh, over time these zones change, but in all cases we have a compression zone higher than three inches uh, throughout the height of the wall, and this is maintained primarily through post tensioning, because there is no other way you can do that. So you have to provide enough post tensioning, which will provide that pre compression to be able to maintain that. So think of it this way: everything to the right of these curves is cracked everything to the left of these curves is in compression. And just to understand the mechanics of how, why is it compressive on the inside, the cold temperature is helping us because on the, the, the wall on the inside is very cold. So it tries to shrink. The wall on the outside is warm. And so the only, so it could go into tension. And the only way to do that is to provide circumferential post-tensioning, which will provide the compression to overcome that. And then similarly, the next chart is for vertical stress. Uh, the vertical is not as critical because uh, you don't have the hydrostatic head causing um, uh, tension. So there it is usually easier to maintain the compression. So you get a much thicker uh, um, section of the wall in, in compression. Okay, 
a little bit about, uh, I hope I'm not going too fast. Uh, if you want me to slow down, I will. Uh, but now we talk a little bit about different construction methods. So one is the traditional cast in place construction method. Uh, and there are two types of these. One is called slip forming, where the form work continuously slides up the wall. Uh, and then if you look at the little uh, sketch on the extreme right, that shows you the, the slip form where you have this form, which is supported on a tie rod or, or a threaded rod in the middle of the concrete wall. And reinforcement is placed in this wall from these platforms and you pour concrete into it. And as you pour concrete and it starts to solidify, you move these, uh, the, these platforms are moved up through jacks. And then from the bottom after about 20, so it's a very slow movement. So you'll move maybe a meter vertically in 24 hours. And from the bottom, you know, you get concrete coming out, which is already set and hardened. So this way you can build a 30 meter tall wall in about 30 days. So it's a very efficient, very quick way of doing it. Uh, the, the tanks in South Hook in Wales, we built using this technique. And then the traditional one is the jump forming technique, uh, uh, technique where we are familiar with how we normally build walls. You, you know, we will build maybe a three meter tall wall, you'll form it up. And then once that has been cast, you take the forms off, you move them up, put them up again, and then you cast the next three meters and you go uh, along, along those directions. So that takes a little bit longer. It will take maybe six, eight weeks to do the same uh, wall. And you have to do it in portions. But this way you will do the whole tank. The whole circumference is done at single time with the slip form. Now, there are, there are other methods. This is so-called barrel precast construction method where, you know, just like in a barrel, you have these slats that are go around and then they are put, the ring is put around them to hold that barrel in place. Similarly, you can uh, build um, um, these, uh, these, these slats out of concrete on the ground, lift, lift them and put them around this um, um, scaffolding and then you can build the whole, whole, uh, whole tank. And I will show you a little bit more detail in the next slide. So this is the formwork that is cast in place on the ground. Then when the panel is cast, it is lifted with a crane and a strong back. It is assembled on the scaffolding. The, uh, you remember I mentioned that there is a carbon steel liner to, meant to, to um, prevent the vapor from, uh, from uh, escaping. So that is welded together along these lines. Uh, there's some short treating done on the interior to fill the gap. Then this whole tank is wire wrapped. So it's like pre-stressing wire is wrapped around it. And then you provide short treating to cover up the pre-stressing, the, the, the wire wrapping and to uh, protect it. So that's uh, another way of doing these tanks or constructing these tanks. I next want to show you some photographs of the actual construction process. And I'm going to show you just some, not every step, otherwise it will take very long. But we start off, as I mentioned, this is usually founded on piles. So there are hundreds of piles. Uh, the, for example, the tanks we build in Golden Pass off of uh, near, near uh, Port Arthur in Texas. Uh, they were like five, 600 piles under, for each tank. Uh, those were steel piles, they were driven into clay. Uh, you know, hundreds of feet because that was a very weak soil. So that's done first. Then a base slab is casted on top. After that, then you will build the walls. And this is, is the picture in the middle. It is a, a wall being jump formed. Then you would come in and you also provide uh, steel plates on the bottom slab again to uh, for vapor control. After this, what they do is they will build the steel roof. So the steel roof is built by placing these um, uh, cords of the whole roof together one by one. Then it is completed. And there's a very unique way of lifting it. You know, you would think, how would you lift this tank or this roof? Well, what they do is they pressurize it. You don't need a very high air pressure. You pressurize it with, you, with compressed air on the bottom of it, and it slowly gets lifted up. And once it's lifted up, it's welded in place, and then it is used as formwork for the concrete roof on top. Now, if you come to the picture in the middle, 
uh, you will see that they are now laying these foam glass foam blocks. These are the form the insulation at the bottom. And you really, this is very critical because if you don't insulate the bottom, the cold, the cold will permeate through the foundation into the soil below and freeze the soil and there will be, you'll have freeze uh, buckling of the soil. So that is very important. And sometimes we also have to introduce um, uh, heating below this in, in case we can't guarantee the, uh, uh, the, the, um, the, the insulation is, is not sufficient or as a backup. The last picture on this on the bottom right hand side is um, the 9% nickel tank on the inside being welded together. So these are large plates and they are welded along vertical lines and along horizontal lines. And what is very interesting is that the welding is done by pure nickel uh, because you can't use normal welding rods. And that weld material in the case of 9% nickel is weaker than the parent material which is again unusual. Normally the weld is stronger than the steel, the normal carbon steel, but here the design or the thickness is, is determined by the weld um, strength. And then all of these welds are tested 100% using AUT automatic ultrasonic testing. And there are special machines which will automatically run around the circumference of the, the tank and it can be done quite quickly. All right, we talked earlier about hydro testing. So this tank, after it is welded together and completed, is filled with water to test. Um, and it's, this test is primarily of the foundation and the settlements, not as much for the welding because we have already tested all the welds with this ultrasonic uh, testing. So again, remember that we cannot fill the tank completely with water because LNG is only half the specific gravity of water. So we would fill it to a little bit more than half uh, because we don't want to overstress the, either the tank or the foundations. And after this is done, it's dried. And then this is the annular space between the two tanks. This is the inner tank, the steel tank, the outer tank, concrete tank. And this is filled with perlite, which is small kind of balls, look like, looks like foam that is sprayed in. And this will provide the insulation on the walls. Finally, the roof, uh, the rebar is laid on the roof and then it is concreted. And then in the extreme right hand bottom picture, you will do all the piping and valving that is needed to be able to uh, uh, you know, deliver LNG into the tank. And then also there are pumps that are placed inside which pump out the LNG uh, to be loaded onto the tankers. So that's kind of a high level kind of view of uh, the construction. What I wanted to do next was to do a case study of foundation design of these tanks, which may be interesting to some of you. And again, this is uh, more of what I think would be of more of interest to geotechnical engineers, but I think this was quite uh, unique to me as well. I had never done this before, but on this particular tank, we had to do this special design. So I, I think you'll find that uh, informative as well. So this case study is of a project in Qatar. Uh, it was for the Raskas company. Raskas uh, it was one of the two companies in Qatar which were producing uh, LNG. Uh, one was Qatar Gas, one was Raskas. Both of these were joint ventures between Qatar Petroleum and ExxonMobil and some other international company, oil companies. By the way, now both of these have merged. So now there's only one company called Qatar Gas. Ross Gas and Qatar Gas merged about five years ago. Okay, so that's some background. So the, if you look at the, the drawing on the right-hand side, you see five tanks here. These were five tanks that were built for Ross Gas for storing LNG. And then we have a building the final of these uh, five or six tanks where we had this issue. On the right hand side, you see something called Future LNG Tank Farm. These were five other tanks that I built for Qatar Gas. Uh, and that's another story, but we won't get into that today. So this tank number six was again a full containment tank with a capacity of 140,000 cubic meters. The outer tank diameter was 79 meters. The LNG was filled to a height of 35 meters. The foundation diameter was 81. And the conceptual design 
uh, for the STANG was to be a pile supported foundation similar to the previous five tanks. Now, this is just a little humorous uh, sketch. You know, you see the, the leaning tower of Pisa in the background and the engineer saying, you know, we can save 700 lira by not doing a soil investigation. So uh, it's kind of a joke, but you know, soil investigation, most of us structural engineers know is critical. Without that, you don't know what you're founding your structure on. So uh, uh, it's always the most important thing we can do and it has to be done early in the game. So this is a busy slide, but bear uh, with me, I will walk you through it. Uh, so let's start a little bit with the text on the left-hand side. So the original soil investigation indicated some minor voids in the calcareous rock layer in two of the five borings. Uh, and this calcareous rock, calcareous rock layer was overlaid with four meters of sand. So now I'm gonna take you through the slowly to the um, chart on the right. So these black dots are the original boreholes. There are actually seven shown here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, but originally there were five and then they did two more. Okay, so these were the boreholes. They showed a few minor voids and not, not much was made of it during the uh, early stage. Now, when the EPC contractor started doing detailed design. Uh, we decided that, you know what, let's do a few more boreholes because let's just make sure the, the, the voids are either limited or let's get more understanding of those. So we actually did a supplemental uh, investigation and these boreholes are shown in green. So we did a lot of boreholes. And as we kept doing these boreholes, we started finding voids. So these voids, were up to 1.4 meters high and with a volume of about 15 cubic meters. And they covered what we estimated about 50% of the tank footprint. So obviously we have a problem now. You know, you can't put this huge tank on top, 140,000 cubic meters of, of, of LNG, which is 70,000 tons of weight, plus all the tank weight, and maybe 100,000 tons or more. So what do you do? Um, well, so the solution we came up with was that we drilled 125 borings, additional which are the red ones at fixed spacing all throughout the foundation area. This is the foundation of, the, this is the, the outline of the tank, you know, the black, black line. And we injected, pressure injected drought into it. So, you know, you would drill a hole, you will inject drought until it didn't go anymore. So, you know, it's full, filled and we recorded the void heights and the injected volumes at each location. And then after we had done all this, we went back and drilled and poured borings adjacent to seven randomly selected voids, you know, obviously the large ones, to verify that the voids were indeed completely filled. So that was step one. Now, having done that, you still cannot guarantee 100% that you've taken care of everything. So we did one more step beyond that. So if you start with the uh, sketch on the right-hand side on top, so the original design is based on pile foundations. This is the area, dashed area, where we found the voids. So what we, we were concerned that by introducing the loads to the base of the pile close to these void locations, we may still overstress the rock layer that has voids. And so we instead chose to increase that distance between the, uh, the void location and where the loads are being introduced by using dynamically compacted rock pillars. So I'll talk more about that. But what we were trying to do was increase the distance between the applied load and the void level from about 12 meters here to about 20 meters. And by doing that, we did uh, an analysis of the foundation and we were able to show that we would reduce the stresses by about 10% at the level of the void. So this is an additional protection that we wanted to do over and above just grouting the voids. Okay, so now, I mentioned earlier that not only do we want to make sure that the ground has the proper strength, but we also want to limit 
um, um, settlements. So we then, what we did was we estimated or calculated settlements of, um, uh, in, in the rock and the foundation after this improvement has been done. So we, and I'll show you how we did the, the rock pillars, but for the rock pillars and the trench at the end or around the perimeter, we actually calculated the settlement and we did different load cases. We did a ring wall and beam. So we did, what we did was we calculated the settlement for this wall and this beam because we built this beam, ring beam, the wall and the roof, left a gap here, did not connect it to the base slab because we want to eliminate some settlement that would occur first so that we don't build that into the final structure. Then we did an analysis for the floor slab, then for the hydro test and for the operating condition. Now, if you look at this graph on the bottom, this line, which is labeled one, is the settlement about two and a half centimeters just from the wall loads and the ring beam. Then we connect it to the base slab and then under the base slab and self weight, you get about half a centimeter of, dis of displacement settlement. And then the line number three, the red line, is the settlement due to the hydro test load. So that's about five and a half uh, centimeters. And then the blue line, the dark blue line, is the final, uh, is the operating settlement, which is for the LNG, because the LNG is a little lighter than the hydro test weight. So we were able to show that the maximum settlement was about 5.7 centimeters, which was less than the allowable eight. And we were also able to show that the differential settlement was only 0.8 per 700, which was also within the one over 700 limit. So this was the way we mitigated this. This was a quite an interesting sub task within the overall project. Uh, so, and I was fortunate to have been involved with that and come up with the solution with my geotechnical engineers. So just, you might be interested, but how do you make rock pillars? You know, we know concrete pillars, concrete columns. What about, how about rock pillars? So what we did was, we, the, the sand itself was not sufficient to take the weight of this LNG tank. So we excavated sand down to the ground uh, water, which is about two or three meters. We, in a, and this was on a five meter spacing in a triangular grid pattern. These were backfilled with 200 millimeter size rock. And then this rock pillar was compacted in layers by dropping a 25 ton weight on it from a 20 meter height multiple times. So, you know, you see at the bottom, you did this multiple times throughout the foundation area, 80 meter diameter. And with that, we were able to dynamically compact not just the rock pillars, but the sand around it was also somewhat dynamically improved. So in order to prove that after this dynamic compaction, we will indeed get the properties we are looking for, we did a field trial. We built seven, seven rock pillars next to the tank and then measured the soil properties post compaction to demonstrate that the value design values had been exceeded. So you see this weight on the bottom one. So it's actually it's dropped from a crane. So you, after you fill the rock, maybe half of the rock uh, pillar is, is built. Then you have a crane which lifts up this weight and drops it multiple times. Then you fill the rest of the uh, uh, pillar and then you drop the, the weight on it again until you get the required uh, soil strength. So similarly, we did the same thing with the trench underneath the ring beam. Uh, we, we excavated it down to competent rock, which was about uh, two meters below the groundwater. Uh, we again filled it in two lifts of, of, uh, of a rock at 200 millimeter diameter. And then within this trench, we uh, compacted pseudo pillars, you know, so every five meters, we would drop this 25 ton weight multiple times to dynamically compact this. And on the bottom uh, right hand, left hand side, you see this crane with the weight on it and it's dropping, you know, it shows you how it dropped it multiple times. And then on the right hand side, you have pictures of how we, you know, you can see the water here 
in the trench and then the first layer of rock and then this is the second layer of rock, uh, second lift of rock. And then at the end, after all of this was done, we actually did acceptance testing as well. We just did not just rely on the trial testing, but we used plate load test on the compacted rock pillars. And by doing this rock pillars, the sand in between also gets compacted because you're putting all this energy into it. And then we tested the rock fill trench and all of these test results exceeded the design values needed. And you know the tank has been standing there for now 15 years and is performing quite well. So uh, Thayer Sab, that's essentially what I have. Uh, I hope I'm still on time, but this is a high level kind of uh, description and I can certainly happy to answer any questions or uh, anything else anyone would like to ask. We thank you, uh, Dr. Khalifa. That was a very informative uh, lecture. And I think a very high tech uh, lecture and uh, people must have uh, gained a lot of knowledge, uh, a new technology, a new subject for them. So if you have any questions, please, uh, uh, you can either type the questions in the chat box or you can ask them uh, through the microphone. For my uh, uh, knowledge, uh, Dr. Uh, I just wanted to know how deep did you explore uh, uh, the boreholes? What were, I, I just maybe it was written on the screen as I have to do a lot of other things. Yeah, I no, just... no, it, yeah, good question. So typically, we would like to do a borehole to the same depth as the diameter of the tank. So if the mm -hmm. tank diameter is 80 meters, then we would drill a borehole down to 80 meters roughly. And okay. typically we do, you know, uh, a couple of boreholes in the middle of the tank, and then you do about three or four around the perimeter. So that's mm -hmm. the general kind of uh, approach that is taken. I also faced a similar problem when I was, I was working in uh, uh, Saudi Arabia in the, mm -hmm. in, the, in, their, uh, in the area where Aramco has a lot of wells, that is the Harad area. Okay. And uh, I was making a transmission line there, power transmission line, and we also encountered a lot of voids during the mm. um, investigation. But since our foundations are only two to three meters deep, so we just right. filled out the web, uh, the voids. And uh, uh, frankly speaking, we did not test them after, <laughs> uh, we did not make any additional borings after filling the voids since the stresses are quite uh, low as compared to your, to your case. So, right. I mean, that transmission line, as I uh, know, it is standing even today. So that was all okay. So I, I think I have a question in the chat box. Let me ask to see it. Yes, this question is from Miss Zohra and she's asking, Sir, is it economical to convert this gas into liquid state at a temperature of minus 168 degrees centigrade without any negative impact on the environment? Yeah, so uh, there's two, two uh, questions here, uh, whether it is economical and what is the impact on the environment? So obviously it is economical, otherwise uh, nobody would be selling uh, LNG. So especially with the economies of scale, uh, you can convert this uh, into LNG and uh, economically and, you know, uh, and it is sold all over the world and a lot of uh, countries are buying LNG because uh, they, they use this gas and it is delivered at, at competitive rates. Now, of course, it is more it is more expensive than what you can you know like in Pakistan if you're getting you're drilling out of Sui and you're getting gas that is certainly cheaper. But if you have no source like that, or if in our case in Pakistan's case, uh, the gas capacity is going down every year, or the reservoir is depleting, and the demand is going up every year. Uh, so if uh, so, so then it is economical in that sense. 
The question of environment is a big one. I mean, it is really uh, the environment is seeing a lot of climate change recently. And obviously it is to do with human um, beings who are using energy and other forms of and agriculture and all other things. So that's a whole bigger question. I think at some point, uh, even the oil and gas industry will generally believe that uh, alternate sources will come up over time and the reliance on um, fossil fuels will go down. Uh, but it's really, the, we use uh, liquid nitrogen is used a lot to, 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 to cool this uh, uh, gas down because liquid nitrogen is uh, even a, a lower temperature uh, uh, when it uh, changes into liquid. So, but to answer the question, yes, it is economic. Okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Saab, I have uh, uh, two questions, rather three. Two are from my side and one is from the uh, our viewer on Facebook. So let me ask uh, my, my question first. Uh, my first question is that if you had not encountered the voids, then I would be interested to know what would have been your design? Would you have again uh, transmitted the loads through the piles? And if piles, what would have been the dia of the pile and the length? This is first question. And the second question is that, uh, as I understood from the lecture, that the case which you are discussing is a new uh, LNG tank for which you had to design the foundation. And there were six prior to this, which were already designed. So right. what, hap what happened on those foundations? What design did you follow? Did you again, uh, I mean, did you check at that time also that the voids were there or not? And then similar treatment was uh, done or you followed some other design? So the five weather tanks were designed with five. They were all <laughs> There is some background noise. Uh, please, please, please mute your microphone. So uh, the other five locations, there were no voids noticed in the uh, in the soil investigation. Now I cannot guarantee that there were no voids. Period. But in the five or six boreholes that we conducted for each of these uh, tanks, we did not notice voids. So they were all piled. Uh, for this one, this was the only one when we took the oil investigation. I guess there's some background noise. I can stop. Mute your mics, mics, please. If you could all mute your mics. So we can. Thank you. So it was only in this one that we found this, um, and I can't remember the diameter, but it's like a meter and a half, I think, meter, meter and a half, and they were about 10 meters uh, long. Uh, can you, were, can you repeat, there was some background no noise again, so can you repeat, please, uh, Jameel? So the diameter was about 1200, 1400, if I remember correctly, and they were about 10 meters deep. Can we just walk the park? Okay, thank you. Hey, I'm sorry to uh, please uh, mute your microphone, Mr. Sarfraz. We are we are getting a lot of uh, noise from your end. Doctor, uh, we have a question from uh, Salim on Facebook, and uh, uh, he's asking a quick. Uh, in case of OBE design, the impulsive and convective masses and forces on tank walls due to LNG are equivalent to hydrostatic forces or lower as, it's, as it is lighter than water. So what is the question? I did not understand. Can you make yeah, it out? So yeah, so yes, during the, 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 the seismic event, uh, you know, the, the so, so remember that the low, the, the liquid is retained on the inner 9% nickel tank, whereas the outer concrete tank is not in the normal operating condition seeing any hydrostat hydrostatic loads. So the inner 9% nickel tank is designed for those uh, movements, or 
from the uh, from the liquid and they are distilled to API 620. So that's a different code for the 9% nickel tank. It's usually an American Petroleum Institute API 620 code that designs to that. But the outer tank does not see any hydrostatic load during the OBE condition. It will, however, see loads in the spill condition. And then the sloshing is not that much because you just have the annulus where the liquid is. And so it does not slosh, uh, but it does have hydrostatic loads. So I don't know if I answered the question, if I understood the question, uh, but hopefully that gives you some more insight into that. Uh, I have another question from engineer M. Asif Sheikh. He's asking after compaction, how it will be tested, especially underground water. So the testing is, we, we used uh, plate testing. Um, so we basically did these plate tests, plate load test, which is one of the methods of evaluating the strength uh, because the load now we are applying to the surface. So you would test that uh, on the surface and then see what the settlement is for a given load. And then that the geotechnical engineers can use that to assess if the appropriate capacity has been achieved. Because remember, we are trying to improve the near surface capacity. We know that further down as we go below the we are only trying to improve the top four meters. Below the four meters, we have rock, which is much stronger than sand. So you could then use the low plate load test because you're only trying to assess the improvement in the top four meters. I don't know if it's my insight. I'm getting a lot of background noise. Or Taisab, are you seeing hearing that also? I am hearing this noise. I... I think the person who in, who who is uh, the host can speak. I think it's done now. I have okay. been muting it. Now we have. Uh, uh, we have a, this, a question again from the Facebook viewer. He is uh, Yasser Salim. Uh, he has praised your lecture first, yeah. amazing lecture. Then he's asking, I do, I do steel bolted tanks, but never seen anything like this. Great to know this information. Another question is, that, what is the thickness of steel plates used for inner steel tank inside the concrete? Normally in water tanks, you have subs for cleaning the tanks. What about LNG tanks? So the 9% the, the nickel inner tank, the thickness varies, uh, is thicker at the bottom. And as you go up the wall, the, hydro, the hydrostatic load goes down, so the thickness reduces. So now you're testing my memory, but I think at the bottom, it could be inch and a half, two inches, and at the top, it'd be close to an inch. But I, I'm going by memory, so I could be wrong here. Uh, but in that order of magnitude. Uh, and then there are pumps inside the tank. Uh, and you, all, you never totally empty the tank from LNG because you want to keep it cold. So there's always some LNG that is remaining. You never drain it completely because this tank always has to be maintained at minus 168. And there is no refrigeration uh, equipment to, to cool it. So it's really cooled by the LNG that you put in. And then when you take it out, you always leave a certain volume at the bottom of the tank so it stays cold. So there are pumps, yes. These are very specialized pumps which work at minus 168 degrees uh, C, uh, but uh, you never completely drain it like you might do with a water tank. Now we have a question from Ms. Tohra. She is asking, do we need any insulation provision in such tanks? Yes, absolutely. As I, let me go back to the picture that I had. You need to insulate these because without the insulation, it will not work. 
So at the base of the tank, if you look at the picture in the middle bottom, you see these glass blocks. So this is glass block insulation, uh, but otherwise the, the, the heat will permeate through the foundation and it will warm up the gas and it will evaporate, become vapor again, gas again. So there's a, this is specialized insulations provided. And then in between the two walls, all along the high, full height of the wall, there is perlite insulation. And then at the top between the uh, concrete roof and there's another suspended steel roof between the two, there's also perlite sprayed in. So there is a tremendous amount of insulation provided. Otherwise these walls would all be cold. You know, that min one minus, one six one, minus 160 at temperature will come all the way outside. So yes, there is a significant amount of insulation provided on all sides, foundation, roof and walls. G, any more questions? We still have a few minutes. If there if any questions, please come forward and you can either type your question or you can ask it through the microphone. So are there any questions on Facebook? This is the last question from my side, but it's, uh, I'm curious to know that uh, can, uh, I mean, if the, do you have any uh, example where these tanks have been, uh, uh, you know, for the foundations, uh, if you have used, considered that for transferring the load to the ground? Instead yeah, of so, yeah, so the ones that we built in Wales, in uh, in uh, the UK, the Southwark project, they were founded on bedrock. So they were just a mat foundation. There was no piles. It was sitting right on granite. So uh, oh. no piles were used. They just sat right on the bedrock. I see. Right. Yeah. So that, that because yeah, you, know, I... you don't have piling. But, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. I guess we have uh, further no questions on uh, uh, the lecture, neither here nor on the Facebook. So, so now I will formally thank you, uh, Dr. Saab, for the lecture. And I'm pretty sure that all of us have uh, uh, enjoyed your lecture and have been uh, brought the new information, new technology. And uh, thank you very much. So now I will make the announcements first, then a certificate for yeah, and thank you for uh, to the Pakistan Society of Civil Engineers for giving me the opportunity to share a few things. You know, I'm at that stage of my career where I'd like to share knowledge and do a transfer of knowledge. So this is something which is close to my heart to talk to young engineers and sh give them some of the things that civil engineers do in the world and hopefully inspire them and to go and do bigger and better things in future. And I also want to tell the participants that Dr. Saab is no stranger to Pakistan Society of Civil Engineers. This is his second lecture. And inshallah, uh, next year, there will be more lectures from uh, him. And we are going to give him more trouble next year, inshallah. So inshallah. Uh, only the day. we are lucky that Dr. Saab is in uh, Malaysia. The time, time difference is not much. It's only three hours. But uh, right. from Canada, when it's posted in Canada or US, USA, there we have to, you know, uh, just uh, make some uh, relaxation to him for the time. And we find out some a midway where he can deliver the lecture. So again, Dr. Saab, thank you very much for such an informative lecture. Now, next lecture would be by Javed Bashir Malik on 11th September. 2021, and as I said, I was just telling about uh, Dr. Khalifa. Uh, Mr. Malik is in uh, Houston, U USA.
So the time difference with the Houston and Lahore is about nine to 10 hours. I'm not uh, sure as to if it is nine or it's 10. So maybe we will have to compromise our time uh, to suit uh, to some midway where it is convenient for the uh, speaker and for the participant in Pakistan. So we are not announcing the time yet, only the date is there, 11 September 2021. And the topic would be second order effect in structures. Uh, this was regarding the next lecture and uh, the certificates, CPD certificates of the participants, you can collect from our office, which is 32B2 Bulldog Main Lahore from 11th of September onwards. And uh, the time, collection time would be 10 to 4, uh, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, onwards, 11th, uh, 11th August, I'm sorry, 11th August, uh, 2021. Uh, Dr. Saab, I think, I don't know whether he's still there. Sir, your, 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 yeah, shield, okay, okay. Your shield and your certificate, inshallah, uh, Ms. Sadia will, Send it by TCS to you by sorry by courier service uh, to Lampur and inshallah you will receive it uh, sometime uh, in the coming week. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, for uh, now there is some update for the society till date we have now two hundred and eighteen members already. Our uh, Rizwan Mirza, who is the editor in chief of our uh, publication, he has already published 11 magazines and uh, 16 newsletters. They are on our website. You people can uh, go there and read it. And uh, this time I also uh, posted it uh, in, on the WhatsApp group. I hope everybody has uh, read it. And I, I would again request if anyone is interested to join our publication board, they can contact uh, Ms. Sadia Navi, Mrs. Sadia Navi or Rizwan Mirza directly. And if they want to give any input there, they are most welcome. So now this will bring to end of this uh, technical lecture number 33. Uh, I don't have any further announcements to make. So, huh? Yes, now I, I always forget and uh, I, I would like to thank you, Ms. Sadia Navi and my IT person, Hasnan, Mr. Hasnan, they are, you can see them on the background. They are the people who assist me and make this transmission uh, uh, go smooth without any problems and so that you can enjoy the trans, uh, transmission. Thank you very much, sir. God bless you all. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.